done shall be. Hip of art, my hip of art. Champions build of liberty. Hip of art, my hip of art. Ever shall thy champions droop, filled with brave, unchanging love, lifting souls to heights above. Hip hop art, my hip hop art. Raise the orange and purple high. Let us shame them never. Shout the triumph to the sky. Hip hop art. Thank you, Gary. Tough act to follow. <laughs> Genevan Thomas Davies Burrell described the moment in September 1820 when Bishop John Henry Hobart chose the site for the college that would eventually bear his name. He wrote, just as the first rays of the sun were glancing over the waters of our beautiful lake, a few friends were present by appointment when on consultation and deliberation on the different opinions of those present, Hobart, in his, br in his brisk and decided manner, struck his cane to the ground saying, here, gentlemen, this is the spot for the college. And on that spot, it was placed. Our college was founded on the traditional land of the Seneca Nation that for generations was the westernmost territory of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. By the early 1820s, when Bishop Hobart visited, Geneva had 1,700 residents, 250 dwellings, two printing presses, a bank, a land office, and an academy. With its vibrant community, Bishop Hobart saw Geneva as the ideal place to establish a college. John Henry Hobart was born in Philadelphia in 1775, educated at the University of Pennsylvania and Princeton University, and ordained a deacon. By 1816, he was the rector of Trinity Church and eventually the third Episcopal, Episcopal Bishop of the state of New York. This church, Trinity Church Wall Street, was Bishop Hobart's home. From here, he traveled the state of New York via horse and buggy to visit parishes and to ensure that his vision for the Episcopal Church in New York was being realized. As we kick off a year celebrating Hobart College and Hobart and William Smith Colleges, it is fitting that we do so here. The ground in which I stand is literally the place from which Hobart College was first imagined, and it is also the final resting place for the man whose vision made it happen. In a complex life of service, there were some things Bishop Hobart got wrong and others that he got right. But there is one thing that has solidified his legacy, the creation of this college that we all love so very much and that has changed the lives of thousands of alumni and alumnae, including everyone watching the live stream this evening and those of us presenting tonight, especially me. In the early years of the college, young men arrived at Hobart on the recommendations of family and friends, having never seen the place. In my day, much like today, prospective students visited colleges and universities before making their big decision. I can remember vivid, vividly the first time I saw Hobart and William Smith. It was the spring of 1977, and it was a beautiful, bright, clear day. Seneca Lake was gorgeous. There were students on the quad playing lacrosse and drinking beer. I was sold. It was at the edge of that lake that I found a place and a community that would become the center of everything. Under the direction of faculty like Pat McGuire and Scott and Judith McKinney, I began to imagine the world as it could be and to understand that the better world would be one that is built together. Today, I'm the vice chairman of the Global Financial Institutions Group at Barclays. It wasn't easy, and it still isn't easy, 
getting to Wall Street from Geneva, New York. But I had two things with me. First, the lifelong friends I made beginning in the fall of 1977 at Hobart College who have been with me on my life journey. We have attended one another's weddings, the funeral of loved ones, bar and bots, and always birthday parties. That has been a gift and has reminded me again and again that we travel an excellent company. Second, it was a sense of confidence that was instilled in me by a confluence of events at Hobart that allowed me to, be a, to better understand myself and how the world works. For my baccalaureate essay, which used to be a required passage to be elevated to senior status, I wrote about economic tragedies going back to the Great Depression. I developed a belief in myself as a thinker. Most of the big investment banks default to hiring people deeply ingrained in finance. The propeller heads, as I call them, those that typically go to Ivy League schools. The world of finance gravitates to those people. But if you look over the longer arc of time, those who ultimately succeed are the people who are running more than just financial models. There's a creativity and a critical thinking that ultimately bubbles up and becomes much more relevant over time. Each of the students I have hired into these very competitive environments, and I've hired and managed quite a few HWS graduates, are confident, driven, and creative thinkers. When they get their chance for the at-bat, they hit it out of the park. They are the poets, and I always bet on the poets. At Hobart and William Smith, we are focused on the future, the future of higher education, the future of the curriculum, the future of our students, the creation of a better future. Surrounding me are some of the people who are the architects and the poets of that better future. With great gratitude for his inspiring rendition of our alma mater is Gary Matheson, class of 1974, who has served the board with unshakable devotion for 14 years. Sonia Naylor Brooks, class of 1989 and the vice chair of the board of trustees, who has answered the call of her alma mater again and again, and whose love for this place is unfailing. Dean of Hobart College, Scott Brophy from the class of 1978, is also a Paramount William, William Smith graduate and professor of philosophy who works to ensure every single day that our students succeed. Paul Wasman, class of 2007, the vice president of the Hobart Alumni Association, which promotes the interests of Hobart College and its alumni and enables alumni to stay connected over the years. And our senior student trustees, Gib Shea and Nushat Wahid, who have been voted by their peers to represent the interests of the students as voting members of the Board of Trustees. Chevy Devaney, from the class of 1995, who is a parent of a recent graduate and a parent of a current senior, uh, who heads our Office of Alumni and Alumni Relations with great dedication and joy every single day. The most reverend Michael B. Curry from the class of 1975, who was the presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church and the chair of the Honorary Bicentennial, Bicentennial Committee. Bishop Curry will deliver the keynote address in just a few moments. And Joyce P. Jacobson, the 29th president of Hobart College and the 18th president of William Smith College, the first woman to hold the position. And importantly, the steward of the next phase in the evolution of our alma mater's bright future, President Jacobson. When Geneva College, which would eventually be renamed Hobart College, was founded two centuries ago, the United States was less than five decades old, and Abraham Lincoln, whose birthday is tomorrow, was just 13 years old. Into this new country came Hobart College, situated on the edge of a picturesque lake in an area of incomparable beauty. The issuing of our charter in 1822 makes us among the 50 oldest colleges and universities in the United States. And what does that signify? It means that our history is defined by ingenuity and perseverance. It had to be. The Civil War, World Wars, the 1918 flu pandemic, the Depression, the Civil Rights Movement, Vietnam, demographic shifts, the Great Recession, 
the COVID-19 pandemic. Whatever challenge the world has thrown, Hobart and William Smith Colleges have adapted and thrived. Whether by prank or by values, Geneva Medical College accepted and graduated the first woman to receive a medical degree, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell in 1849. When Hobart College was on the brink of closing in 1908, President Langdon Stewardson made a deal with local philanthropist William Smith to found a college for women, a relative rarity at the time and a move that radically changed our future. When the drafts of World War II depleted the number of men who could enroll in college, President John Potter signed a contract that brought the Navy V-12 program to campus. In response to the Civil Rights Movement, the colleges created one of the first black studies programs in the nation. I could go on and on. Curricular innovation, creative programming, women's studies, global studies, the Salisbury Center for Career Services, the LGBTQ Plus program, the Centennial Center for Leadership, the Bazuto Center for Entrepreneurship. That kind of history, one defined by entrepreneurialism and determination, sets us up for a very bright future. When we developed and approved our current strategic plan in the spring of 2020, we focused on three broad areas, increasing academic effectiveness, building financial and operational excellence, and enhancing the college's reputation. We continue to work toward multiple goals in all those areas. I have been so impressed with how the HWS community has rallied to support our ambition even through the challenges of the pandemic. We have seen major curricular innovations launched on the part of faculty and staff, increased our fundraising substantially over the past three years, significantly increased the number of applications from prospective students this admission season, implemented numerous behind-the-scenes innovations in how we conduct our business, and completed a significant project of rebranding and updating our website, print, and social media strategy. I like to refer to the colleges as spunky and scrappy, as they have always persisted through difficult times, but they also need more underpinnings of support for their journey. We must continue developing relevant academic options for the 21st century, along with building on a strong infrastructure of financial and technological support for our students, faculty, and staff. With that support, the colleges will have the ability to become even more innovative going forward. Let's return to our past for a moment. Bishop Hobart died in 1830 at the age of 54. Afterward, the members of Trinity Church donated the funds necessary to create a marble monument to him that is today located just outside this room. There, Bishop Hobart is shown in the last moments of his life being embraced in the arms of faith. It took faith to start a college by the edge of a lake in upstate New York, a location that would become the right place for so many beginnings. It took faith for that college to adapt to and survive the vicissitudes of two centuries. It takes faith to always stay true to our values, remaining dedicated to cultivating incredible minds, relentless curiosity, and remarkable hearts. Across generations, we have thrived, and today in this place, we pay homage to our past as we also look with hope to our future. The theme of the Hobart Bicentennial, Hip Hobart Forever, comes directly from the alma mater, performed so ably tonight by Gary Matheson, but first performed in 1900 by the Hobart Glee Club after Professor C.J. Rose, class of 1876, composed the music and Edward John Cook, class of 1895, wrote the lyrics. It is a reminder, always, to celebrate Hobart College and to do everything possible to honor the past as we build to an even better future. It is now my honor to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the evening, the Most Reverend Michael B. Curry. Bishop Curry has dedicated his life to making what he calls the redemptive power of love a palpable force in the world, and since 2015, has served as the 27th Bishop and Primate of the Episcopal Church, the first African American to hold the church's top leadership office. An advocate for an inclusive, authentic ministry, he is committed to racial reconciliation, 
equal justice, and equal opportunity. In his role, he has become a voice for our nation and our world, providing words of wisdom and hope. He is a Hobart alumnus who is unequivocally leading a life of consequence. Bishop Curry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, President. Thank you so much, and thank you. Um, and to Gary, I was wondering what hip Hobart was gonna sound like. Thank you, my brother, I loved it, <laughs> I loved it. And I, I thought about the word hip, and I don't know what it was at the turn of the last century, but I imagine that word hip meant one thing. And when we were at Hobart and William Smith, hip meant another thing. And, and I know that at the Super Bowl, there'll be hip hop tomorrow. So just that singular word has had quite a history, um, as has Hobart College and Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And it is a, a real uh, privilege and, and a blessing to, um, to live long enough to know, as you said, how the institutions and communities and the people who have formed you actually made a difference in your life and hopefully in the lives of others and in the life of the, the greater world around us. And, and for that, I give God thanks. And I thank Hobart and William Smith Colleges profoundly. Let me, um, I'm not gonna be, be long, but let me, first say a, a few words of thanks um, to the folk here at, at Trinity Church. Um, I saw Father Michael Bird. I don't know where Michael is. Oh, there he is. Uh, there. Uh, Michael, please uh, tell uh, Phil Jackson and your whole staff and um, all the good folk of the Trinity community uh, a thank you from us. Um, as as uh, Chevy said to me earlier, she said, you got to tell them they have just been the most remarkable partners to work with. Um, and you have been and you always are, and we thank God for you. So just tell everybody, hip, hip, Trinity. <laughs> and a and, uh, continued word of thanks to all who make um, these wonderful colleges possible in these days and in the days to come. Uh, we don't know what's ahead of us, um, few of us, save the epidemiologists and those who do those kinds of studies, anticipated um, that uh, 1918 would revisit us in a new way, um, though we kind of knew that was a possibility, but none of us really thought about it. And so we do not, we do not know, um, as my grandma used to say, we do not know what the future will hold, but ultimately we know who holds the future. And when you put those two together, you can deal with whatever you've got to deal with in the days ahead. So thank you. And happy birthday. Happy birthday, Bishop Hobart. Assuming you've gone to a better place, but if you're back there, happy birthday, wherever you are. <laughs> it's, I was, what I was thinking about, some things to say that, that would be appropriate um, to this, I was trying to think, make some connections between uh, the impact of Hobart and William Smith on, on my, my life personally um, and, and what I do now and hopefully its impact. And I remembered um, a conversation with my father. I, when I was at commencement, I had a conversation with my father only that when I was only 13 years old. This conversation happened probably the August of, sometime in August of 1971. I'm guessing that, Betty, is that when we, I think that was, we, we, we were freshmen in 1971, somewhere thereabouts, or 72. We're at the age now where numbers don't matter. <laughs> and I was uh, in the car with my father, and we probably were shopping, I'm guessing, getting ready to go to school. And at one point, he just said, I was driving. And he said, you know, now, I was getting ready to go to Hobart and William Smith. And he said, now, you need to remember, when you go to school, you treat every girl the way you want somebody else to treat your sister. 
And, you know, he said that and, and the train that followed that when we were growing up. I mean, it was kind of a common family refrain. But I remember thinking, man, I, I don't want to hear that before going to school. You have just ruined four years of planning that I had. Um, I mean, you, you just kind of messed up my whole whatever plans I thought I had in mind. But I knew what he meant. Treat every girl the way you want somebody else to treat your own sister. Treat every boy the way you want somebody else to treat your brother. Treat every woman the way you want somebody to treat your mother. Treat every man the way you want somebody to treat your father. Treat them as if they are members of your family. Now, he didn't expound it, but he said it all while we were. Treat them like members of your own family. Show them the same dignity, honor, and respect that you would want for your own kinfolk. Then don't stop there. Then go out and construct a society and work to build a society where every man, woman, and child, every person is treated not as an object, not as a thing, not as someone to be used or abused, but treated as a child of God, enshrined not only in the mind of God, but in the eyes of the law and in the hearts of everyone. Treat, treat every girl, every boy, every man, woman, every person, like your own kinfolk. That's what I remember him telling me when I was off to Hobart and William Smith Colleges. It didn't occur to me that there was more to that than some fatherly wisdom. I mean, I knew the message. And my father was involved in civil rights, and so that was kind of, there was, that wasn't out, out of character either. But I didn't realize that that was part of a larger, deeper, grander narrative that was not simply something a parent said to a child. Until I got to Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And about 1972 or three, don't remember, I read this book. This is the actual book. It's by, it was by Ira Smith, and K Kenneth Smith and Ira Zapp. And the title of the book was Search for the Beloved Community, The Thinking of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And this was in the early days of King scholarship, just beginning to develop. And one of the things early King scholars realized was that one of the central governing motifs that he didn't use rhetorically that much was the motif of the beloved community. At one point in 19, after the Montgomery bus boycott, Dr. King actually um, did almost kind of blurt out in a press conference when they said, okay, the bo bus boycott has begun the process of desegregation of public transportation. It's actually accomplished its goal. So, so what's the goal? And King probably off the cuff said the goal is redemption. The goal is reconciliation. No. The goal of civil rights is not just my rights, not just your rights. It's even bigger than justice. The goal is the creation of beloved community. And therein will be justice. Therein will be equity. Therein will be as as those Africans enslaved used to sing, plenty good room, plenty good room, plenty good room for all God's children. And behind all the language of a dream, <laughs> behind all of the images that are known to King is the undercurrent, the underground stream of laboring to create from our jangling discords and chaos a beloved community here in the United States and ultimately in the world. That connection I learned at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And it's become a commitment of my very life 
and what I hope and pray will be the commitment of the Episcopal Church long after Michael Curry is gone. And maybe a commitment of a country called the United States and maybe of this world. That's Hobart and William Smith. That's the impact of a school. And that's the hope of a country and a world. A few weeks ago now, I guess it was, uh, I was in Washington um, on January 6th for a, a variety of services, commemorations um, on, the, on January 6th of, of this year, following on last year. And as you know, January the 6th, what happened was not simply a news event, but a cultural and social revelation. A revelation in many respects, it doesn't matter what your politics are, this isn't a political, this is not partisan, don't, 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 I'm not gonna mess up the development work, don't worry. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, but, but, but what happened on January the 6th for us was that we suddenly realized that, or I realized, let me just talk to you an I statement. I realized that I have taken this experiment in multiracial pluralistic democracy for granted and assumed that it would also always be here. I grew up in a civil rights home that never assumed that the democracy wouldn't be here. The point was to make the democracy become what it says it is. But on January 6th, when we saw the walls of the capital of the United States of America breached, and this was not the 19th century, it was a terrible moment of apocalyptic revelation. And we realized that there are deep divisions, that there is deep pain and deep hurt that could undo this land that we love. And so a month ago, there were commemorations and prayer services. And I'd been asked to, at the end of the day to go to Capitol Hill and quietly gather the members of House and Senate who had been in sessions of sorts all day long. And as Speaker Pelosi said, we just need you to pray over us. We just need you to pray, that's it. And I realized that once again, the bomb in Gilead that can show us the way both to heal and to restore is that beloved community. Dr. King said we will either learn to live together as brothers and sisters or we will perish together as fools. The choice is ours, he said, chaos or community. It's that clear. This ain't rocket science. Chaos or community? The choice is ours. The destiny is in our hands. And we must decide. And so I remembered I went back again to class at Hobart and William Smith. And I don't remember what the class was. It was a history class, that part I remember. But the subject of Cicero of the Roman Republic came up. And in passing, the professor in the lecture mentioned some relationship between Cicero and the great seal of the United States of America. And I remember sitting there and thinking back when, when, when he said that, and I thought back to the fifth grade when I was in Miss Lenny's class. And in the fifth grade, I remember she was teaching us about the great seal of the United States. And you know, the, you know what I'm talking about, the great seal with the eagle and the, you know, like, 
Uh, and by the way, there was a great debate, as some of you know, um, as to whether or not the eagle would be the, the bird of the United States or the turkey. Um, dear God Almighty, thank God Almighty, Benjamin Franklin lost that debate. And, and if you want, uh, uh, Michael Bird can tell you at St. Paul's Chapel, which is part of um, one of the original depictions of the original great seal is at St. Paul's Church, just down the street from here, and it has the turkey. It is the scariest, ugliest thing I have ever seen. <laughs> it's, <laughs> so anyway, you know, in the great seal, Miss Lenny had, we had these, you know, the things you draw when you're in the fifth grade. And, you know, we, we drew the, the eagle and the, you know, the, 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 the palm branches and one tag and, and, and then the uh, our olive branches in one and then the arrows in the other. And then above, e pluribus unum, from many, one. And I remember her explaining that's the motto of the United States of America. A motto is the aspiration. It is a statement of who you long and pray and hope and labor to be. It is a claiming of your identity that can strengthen you for the present and clarify for the future. And she said the motto e pluribus unum, from many one, is the motto of the United States of America. For many diverse peoples, one people, one nation, with liberty and justice, not for some, but for all. In the midst of our turmoil, after January 6th, I went back to Cicero, or I went back to the motto to see where and when did Cicero say it and discover that Cicero used the phrase e pluribus unum, although apparently Virgil did as well, but it was like in a recipe for pesto. Anyway, I, I don't, anyway, that's a whole other issue. I, I thought, I'm just going to leave that one to Emerald or somebody. I'll leave that one alone. But, but, but apparently Cicero was writing, check this out, on how the family or household, Roman family or household unit is constituted. And, and, he, and he said this, and this is what was taken and lifted to the motto of the United States of America. I quote, when each person loves the other as much as he loves himself, it makes one out of many possible, e pluribus unum. Love for others beside yourself makes e pluribus unum possible. Love for others beside just the self makes the United States of America possible. Love for others beside just the self will show us the way to take our jangling discords and create a beautiful symphony of love and compassion and justice and goodness and kindness. Treat every girl the way you want somebody else to treat your sister, because she is your sister. And every boy like your brother, because he's your brother. And every woman like your mother, because she's your mother. Every man like your father. Every person like your sibling. Whoever they are. And the nightmare will end. And the day will break through. And the midnights of our greatest despairs will be the beginning of the dawns of new days. I learned that at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And when I retire from the Episcopal Church and they make a nice, Michael, I want a really nice something like Hobart back here. I want something really nice. <laughs> you know? And when I'm, I'm gone off the scene, the work to create the beloved community 
not just here in the United States, but here in this world, will be the work that is left behind. And if one church does it, another can. And one religion does it, another can. And if one political group does it, another can. And if one group does it, and another can. And if more of us do it, the nightmare can end in the beloved community can be born. That's the birthday for John Henry Hobart's school. And that is the birth of a new world. God love you. God bless you. And may God hold us all in those almighty hands of love. Hip Hobart. <laughs> okay, thank you. Guys. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much, Dr. Curry. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I hear you, indeed every time you speak, you both instruct and inspire. And it's a blessing for all of us that you are here tonight to help us kick off this bicentennial year for Hobart. I want to thank everybody in the audience here for coming tonight. I want to thank all of you watching back in Geneva and other places all around the world for our Hobart and William Smith community. Thank you all, and hip Hobart forever. Raise the orange and purple high, let us shame them down.